pleasure to be here. And I have done, I'm going to give you basically my standard talk, but, <laughs> but um, I have done a little bit of research to remind me what life was like 20 years ago and what, how far we've come. And just to remind you that, of course, we all are always standing on the shoulders of giants. I hope I don't need to tell this audience about people like Vannevar Bush, who really forecast the whole global information system, hypertext, hypermedia stuff, without talking about any of that and without knowing what a computer was. And we all base it. And then there's Ted Nelson, um, and uh, you know, um, gave us hypertext, hypermedia in the 60s, and. Um, uh, and his famous catchphrase is, everything's deeply intertwined. And of course, um, the late great, uh, he left us recently, Doug Engelbart, who invented all these things that we're using to the mouse and the windows and so on, and uh, really did the first hypertext demo, demo over the ARPANET, I suppose it was, in 1967. The 60s, of course, was when Ted coined the phrase hypertext hypermedia. And these are the guys that really inspired me and we mustn't forget, of course, that none of what we do today with the web would be possible without guys like Vince and Bob, who um, gave us the internet, not just the technology, but the, the democracy of it. Um, that's terribly important in the web story, that you have this idea that you have this network that, that we, the people, really, or the people that understand networks, um, vote to decide how it develops. That's how it is at the moment, and part of what we have to do is fight to keep it free and the web. So where does Mount Batten fit into this? Well, um, 19, this was um, 1987 at Southampton, um, and I'd already, um, that was, was a year, I think, that I first started to hear about this thing called hypertext, partly because there was, it was the year of the first hypertext conference in the States. I wasn't at it, um, but you heard about it. And Apple released uh, their new Mac then, and on it was this thing that allowed you to make links between stacks of cards, and they called it HyperCard. Um, and that, because they, they felt this new thing buzzing, this idea of making links between things on computers, documents on computers. And that, 1987, it was also the year of, um, I haven't got the clip to show you because I didn't want to put the videos in today, it just slows things down, but uh, there was a program made by the Horizon people at BBC called Hyperland, and I don't know if any of you remember Hyperland, it was Max Whitby and it was, it was Douglas Adams commentating and Tom Baker was the agent, and it was all about what the future of hypertext and hypermedia was going to be in a simulated way. And all this really inspired me. And that same year, 1987, the Mountbatten Archive arrived at Southampton. And uh, here I am uh, in the archive. Many people will say that that's my shoe collection. That always gets a laugh. But <laughs> that's the Mountbatten Archive, and that was multimedia in those days because it was photographed, it was um, video, it was uh, old uh, LP, old, the big old um, record. <coughs> It was a load of text, 250,000 text documents. And we got these new things called video discs and video disc players and hypertext and hypermedia. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get digitized this collection and then put it onto a video disc and, you, you, you know, which would put the multimedia on the video disc and then on the computer have a hypertext system that links it all together. And maybe we could have different links for different people. Um, so that uh, school kids could ask, get different information through experts in history. And this began the microcosm trail, and uh, Hugh is sitting in the audience, um, who followed this trail with me very much out of school. And one of the things I wanted to do, really, was to not just have links that pointed to documents, but to, um, to other documents, but actually said why that link was there, so a semantic relationship. This was the associative linking that Vannevar Bush had been uh, talking about in his paper. And the book I wrote with David Lowe in 1999 captures some of that idea. And so we started to build the microcosm system. Probably about 89, we started to spec it. And we had our first demo working in, I think, early 1990, um, using uh, digitized documents from the archive. Uh, this idea was very much that you wouldn't put the links into the documents. You'd have these 
links describing the relationships between the items in the document. So you might say, here's um, a document in, of Mountbatten um, when he was um, viceroy in Delhi and uh, uh, minutes in a meeting and, and here's a photograph of what happened to people at the meeting and you link them together with that relationship described. Um, so our links were entities in their own right and we put them in databases. We did wonderful things with our links in microcosm. This is not a microcosm talk. You can read all about it in our papers, books, and on the web. But um, it was really exciting, and um, here we are. This is the sort of technology we had in those days. Um, there's a video of this fellow somewhere in, around, I imagine. It's not in, it doesn't seem to be in that shot, but uh, lots of floppy disks and all sorts of... That was what multimedia was like. That, I think, it looks to me like a picture of the Mount Batten archive on that shot, but it could have been one of our other applications. Um, so, then along comes this guy. Now, this, the doc, this is Tim, of course, and Tim Bunsley, and the document in the middle there is the, the, it, the document he wrote in 1989. So this was the same year as we were specking microcosm, and the people in Austria were doing Hyper-G, and there was lots of buzz around the world about hypertext hypermedia and on a grand scale. And we were thinking about the links and the relationship between the links. But there were a lot of people out there thinking about what this hypermedia on a network means. Particularly this man who's sitting in CERN wanting to enable physicists from all around the world to share their documents on this newfangled thing called the internet. Remember, in, if you remember, actually this audience looks like it remembers the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I talk to school children or, you know, a lot, a lot younger audiences who have no clue what it was like before the web. But um, uh, in the 80s, what was I talking about? Yeah, we were starting to use email in the research labs anyway. And uh, certainly our boss, David Barron, got us using email as absolutely as soon as it existed, so we didn't have to meet face to face. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> True of you. <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, Tim is um, trying to get physicists to share stuff on the internet. And... Um, he wrote this proposal in 1989 to his boss, Mike Sendall, and it's, called, it's not called the web at this stage, it's called Information Management, a proposal. You can see the document on the web, and uh, it basically describes the web. And uh, it, most of it was in his head, but this was the, the, the spec for how it would work, and it described HTML, HTTP, the idea of hypertext, the idea of documents stored on a server, and the idea of clicking and, and, and going, pulling a document down over the internet. And Mike Sendall, his boss wrote it, and it's in that magnifying glass there. He wrote at the top, vague but exciting. And that gave Tim permission to go off to carry on building the web as part of his job at CERN. And of course, I could just stop there and say the rest, of course, is history. Um, one of the things I'll make the point is that we, are, we should be, although I would resist the fact that the physicist invented the web and it was all down to CERN, I don't think they knew it much about what they had there, but they did give it away. They did allow Tim to give it away, which is one of the fundamental things about when them, about the web, when there were systems around in the late 80s, early 90s that allowed you to go and get documents other than typing FTTP commands, things like Gopher. And um, Gopher came, I think, from Minnesota. Who, yes, yeah, somebody said, but uh, well, whoever it was, around this time, the university um, there decided they, they liked this thing was getting very popular and they should start charging for it. And that killed it, actually, because along came this, this web thing that was free um, and did it all better. So that's, a, that's for discussion, that's high positive. So we all went off, I can't remember who you, if you were in Paris, 1990, was it, was it we? Can't remember. But anyway, we took our, we took microcosm, well, we took the paper, our first paper. So, and that's, this is where I first met Tim. Um, so this, uh, there's the photos from this, uh, the conference, and you can see uh, the attendees at the conference on the web. This is the first European Hypertext conference. There's Tim in his jacket there, talking to our colleague, Andrew Fountain. Behind him is Ian, with a grey leather jacket, is Ian Heath, who wrote the first version of microcosm, and he wore that leather jacket for most of his PhD. I'm not sure about the T-shirt. <laughs> and um, behind him is Robert Kaye, who gets lost in the mist of history, but at the t uh, was, was very much um, partner with Tim at this stage in terms of getting the web out. It wasn't called the web at this stage. Tim was there talking about 
how big his network was going to be. Um, and then I'm down here with Mike Kibbe. Some of you will remember Mike Kibbe. Um, and uh, you, that, so that, and that's Ian Heath's leather jacket there, so that's the proof that we were at the same. You, know, you can see on the web it says the participants. So I first met Tim, and it was one of those conversations we were talking about microcosm. He was talking about this thing that wasn't yet called the World Wide Web. And, um, uh, but we, we have remained friends and collaborators ever since. Um, I didn't get what he was talking about. He often he used to say to me things like, Wendy, if only you understood what I was talking about. <laughs> but I, you see, I, anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so the next year we go to the ACM. I never dreamt I would end up being the president of this organization. Um, this is the Association of Computer Machinery we met, the big um, American-based uh, computer society. Um, and this was my first ACM conference, and we went off. We submitted another paper on microcosm, and um, they rejected it. As, uh, you know, American you know, you think, oh, they don't get it, they didn't get it. But anyway, uh, this was the, pe the, the conference that famously rejected Tim's paper on the web. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yes, Tim would say, it wasn't the greatest of research papers, but pretty big idea. And anyway, what do you do if you get a paper rejected from a conference? You submit a demo or a poster. So uh, we submitted a demo of Microsoft, and Tim and Robert submitted a demo of the web, and that was the first time I saw it. It was called the web then. He had put the first website up in Christmas 1990. Called it the web. And I remember thinking, how pretentious. Has he put the World Wide Web? It's like the World Baseball Series. Um, <laughs> and I remember also two things about this conference. So, you know, there was a, there was a demo session at the, uh, you know, the evening time. And this was Texas. Um, and outside, it was a hotel, I remember, because Tim had a problem getting online, because no, there were no internets in hotels in those days. And um, uh, there, outside in the courtyard, there was a big barbecue and a tequila fountain. So everybody was outside having margaritas. Um, and uh, I can remember it got very quiet in the demo session. And I remember looking with Peter Brown, who did the guide. I don't know if anybody remember Peter Brown from Kent. And um, he, um, we were looking over Tim's shoulder and thinking, well, there's not much new here. These links, it was just embeds his links in the documents. And it just points to something. I mean, you know, this is not very exciting hypertext. Hmm. How wrong can you get? So by the time we get to uh, 93, the next ACM conference there, well, every other year then, is where there's a European one in between. Uh, they merge, the conferences merge later. But um, the next Hypertext conference in 93 in, in that, uh, was in Seattle, I think. Half the demos were the World Wide Web. And this is, I checked this with Jonathan earlier, I'm just, I actually got out my Cal 93 proceedings. Because I had a memory that that's where Alt was launched. And Jonathan said, I'm right. Hmm? I'm right. It was, it was Cal 93. Um, I won't tell you what else he said just before. But, um, <laughs> uh, later. But, um, this, this was the, I, the sort of work. Um, and I'm not, this is, it, I'm really trying to tell, tell you about journeys and where, you know, how actually great ideas come around, go around and come around. What comes around goes around. So our paper and Nick Hammond's paper, it was in York, I think, um, were our hypermedia papers were all implemented in HyperCard. So it was a paper called Learning with Portable Computers. Isn't that wonderful, the idea of a portable computer? Um, very new in those days, of course. The idea of video-supported learning using a video disc. And when you think about YouTube today, and everything we're doing with MOOCs, then, but the whole point, that work was so important because it, it, it blazes the trail for when the technology gets to the point you can do really interesting things with it. Also, I, I saw a paper on natural language programming to support reading, you know, the idea that you can, you could have some artificial intelligence support for, to help, this is learning reading, I mean. And then a, the Lego logo, uh, paper in this conference, and I'm thinking Raspberry Pi, you know? Um, and uh, I look at beautiful. This actually, this conference proceedings was produced by Mike Kibbe, and um, a typical Mike Kibbe, the index was perfect. It's the most beautiful. I was just looking at it, I've got it in my bag actually. 
Um, I was looking at it in, a, in my hotel room earlier, and the, it's the most beautiful index I've ever seen of a conference proceedings. Um, that was what Mike was like. The interesting thing is, of course, this is 93. It doesn't mention the web or the internet or networks. There, it does mention electronic mail spelt out in full in a paper on computer-mediated communication. So I thought it was the mail. So, so ALT is launched, and uh, the first ALT conference was in 94. Uh, I wasn't at that, but um, Sue was, <laughs> uh, giving papers on microcosm. Um, microcosm wasn't connected to the network. We, we kept talking about it, but actually we were already uh, very much doing a lot of work on the web, um, as well as developing our microcosm ideas. And um, of course, what we, what we didn't realize then was we were being pre very prescient in microcosm about the semantic web, because we were doing lots of things with relationships and links. But um, there was lots of stuff about TLTP projects. If you remember Teaching and Learning Technology Program, I think it stood for. A lot of money went into that. Um, and multimedia was a term that had begun to become very uh, dominant. Distance learning with... Oh, that should be CD-ROM. Sorry. Distance learning with CD-ROM. I thought that was such an interesting, quaint concept. <laughs> you know, just the idea that in that short space of time, a technology like CD came and went. Uh, that is meant to be CD, I just took the D out. But I remember someone, when the internet was very, still in its early days and very slow, or the web on the internet, and someone said, don't underestimate the, the, the rate at which you can get information to people filling a jumbo jet full of CDs. And in those days, that actually made a lot of sense. A multimedia course, well, this was the title of a paper, multimedia course, well, never mind the quality, how much will it cost? Um, and this was when... I thought, I thought then, th I'm thinking forward to MOOCs today, what we're thinking about today, um, but also the revolution in terms of the way we get access to multimedia these days through the Googles and the YouTubes and everything else that we have. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a paper called Intelligent Tutoring Systems, which is another term that we've never used these days, but the work that was done in that area was hugely important. Real-world applications. I didn't have time. No. I didn't have a copy of the paper because Marin had to send me the PDF file and it was just the list of contents of the conference, so I don't have a copy of that paper, but I thought, I wonder what the real-world application was. And there was a discussion session on the World Wide Web called Accessing a Global Database. So it had started to move into this area. 94, of course, was the first year of the first web conference. The web was really beginning to take off. And um, the, uh, those of you who remember the very early days, Tim's first uh, interface for the web was both a browser and an editor, and it was quite complicated to use. And um, the Mosaic guys, well, the people in Illinois, uh, and Mark Andreessen, uh, developed Mosaic as a browser, which was just a read-only, and that's when the web really began to take off, because it was simple for people to download and use. Um, and they were pushing very hard Firstly, if you read Tim's book, Reading the Web, he tells you in that that they tried to change the name of the web to Mosaic. And for a long time, the Americans thought that the web was Mosaic. It was an American invention called Mosaic, for a few years anyway. Um, and it's only really since the Olympics that Tim has been that well known in America. The Olympics last year, I mean, he did that performance. You, you hear the, the ABC, was it ABC or CBS commentators when he came on the show? Uh, that has raised Tim's, that appearance in the Olympics has raised Tim's profile hugely around the world, if he wasn't well known enough anyway. But, um, so what happened was that Robert and Tim pushed very hard to have the first web conference at CERN in May 94. I've got the t-shirt, that's the t-shirt I'm proud of from all my, proudest of all my conferences. And um, I throw most of them away, but I've kept that one. And then the second one was the same year in Chicago, run by the, the guys from Illinois. And here's the, oh, well, let's just, before I get to here's the story of the web, just a few comments about why the web won. Um, first of all, it's a network thing. But the thesis that Tim had was that the network effect is everything for hypertext. And so either everybody will use it or nobody will. So all of us doing our little hypertext programs on floppy disks or PCs or, you know, with a few 
hundreds or thousands of documents, and but the only people that could look at, only person that could look at the person looking at that screen, had it wrong. The 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 and but this thesis means that that the if you look at the maths, the way the networks work, which I won't go into here, it basically means that because it's built. In, this, in the way that Tim built it, so it's very easy for everybody to use, and he gave it away for free, then it means that there is only one of everything, generally. So there's one search engine. I mean, there are lots of them, but there's a dominant one. In maths, it's a... a um, oh, God, giant attractor. Um, you know, the other people come and go, and but once you get a dominant one... You want to be where everybody else is. And the thing is that the more people that are there, the better and richer that environment becomes. So there's one Facebook. I mean, there was a MySpace, and it's still there, but it's tiny. And there's one shop, Amazon, and there's one auction house, eBay. There are different versions of those in different cultures and different countries. You go out to China, there Google is Baidu, there Twitter is Weibo. They have the same stuff, but millions of people using it, of course. But generally, there is one dominant version of all these things. There's one YouTube. So you don't have to decide where you go to look for your video. You just go to YouTube. That's what makes it all work. And people who don't get this don't get the web. And actually, this will apply to MOOCs too. I'll just leave you with that thought as you're developing your MOOCs. Make sure you're with the right ones. I have no idea about which one is going to be the dominant and how that will work, but for sure, eventually, there'll be one place you go and look for your moots, I would, I would predict. Um, the other thing that was very important about the web was error 404. And this taught me a lot about human behavior, because I can remember hypertext papers that said, that proved that if you had dodgy links, links that failed, or pointed to the wrong thing, or were dead, people didn't use your system. And what Tim's hypothesis was, we're not perfect about the way we store information, we're not perfect about, we don't tell our servers when we move files, and we don't label things properly, and we're not organized very well. Brain does it brilliantly, but that bit from here to there doesn't work very well. And um, we're lazy, and untidy, and busy, and you've got to let the links fail in order for it to stay. That's my paraphrase. But uh, this was hugely important. So although there were error 404s, you sort of didn't mind because what you had was better than nothing. And uh, the final thing, as I've, I've mentioned several times, is that the real gift that Tim gave to the world was he gave it away. He didn't seek to make He's never sought to make money out of it. He doesn't have money. Um, he gave it away because he, he, his hypothesis was that's the only way it would work. And, of course, it's an experiment we can't rerun. It always reminds me of Douglas Adams, Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the fact that we're actually all an experiment run by the mice. Um, maybe the web is an experiment run by the wife, but mice, but it would be hard to re rerun it now. The only thing that might happen is we, there are several different ways in which we can kill this thing that we have created, and if we did, or, you know, take, for example, what's happening on Twitter. I'm getting a bit off, oh, this is something I might, a story I might have told later, the trolling on Twitter. I'll tell you a bit of the Twitter story later, but, you know, if women or anybody feel that they don't want to be on Twitter because of the bull bullying, they won't be on Twitter, and Twitter won't be on. And then what happens to all the marketers and the... Um, the celebs and, you know, I mean, it, we have, just as we do with the physical planet, we have the ability to kill this thing that we have created um, in many different ways, many, many different ways. Um, and so, you know, the whole net neutrality debate about keeping it open, an open playing field for access. And the key thing about what Tim did was the protocols were open, he didn't make, try to commercialize it, and they were universal. So wherever you go in the world, whatever you're doing, whatever app, in whatever language, whatever culture, the protocols and standards you use to, access, to put that app on your phone or on the internet or wherever are the same all over the world. And that, you know, same, true for the internet and true for the web. So important. 
links. And all my, oh, but we've got much cleverer links than you've got, all had to go on hold for about 15 years. Um, but boy, have we built, I don't mean we at Southampton, I mean the world has, or the world that has the web now, and it will be the whole world, I guess, the whole world with mobile phones. Um, has, uh, it's, a, it's a strangely linked to straw because actually making hypertext links on the web is quite hard and you don't organize it very well. But that's another whole story. I won't go into that one. But, but um, uh, we have built the most amazing thing. And what happened, of course, was Google came along uh, to help because we were developing our links, the, the clever links to help you find things and help you create hypertext. So what happened was that Google came along. And here's the graph. I love using. Um, this is produced by a PhD student of mine. And so the red line are the, effectively the number of users of the internet using the web. The blue line are the number of hosts. Green is he's put Facebook on and he's put Twitter on, the last version. This, is, this slide is all over the web. It's um, readily available on Creative Commons. But um, several stories. I've told you the mosaic story. And of course, they commercialized and... Um, created Netscape Navigator, and then you have the apocryphal story of Bill Gates and Microsoft, Bill Gates saying, network, what network, we sell operating systems for PCs, and then famously changed his mind that night, whatever it was, whatever short space of time, that ends up with um, a web browser in the operating system in Windows called Internet Explorer, which wipes Net Netscape Navigator off the map. Uh, all sorts of stories around that. But just to set the story of the dot-com bubble is a lovely one because you can see Amazon emerges in 96. And, and that was the beginning of when people saw that there was money to be made in technology. They all wanted to be Bill Gates. So they saw these new companies coming up and the investors piled in without really knowing what this landscape was. And if you look to the, your right and look at when Wi-Fi and broadband emerged. Remember what access to the internet was like before you had a high-speed network in your home. BT turned it off last week, the phone access to the internet. It was painful at times, wasn't it? It made that awful noise, and then it timed out, and trying to load a picture was like this. And so nobody had computers in their homes. There's no real reason, unless you were techie, um, to have one, and so you're selling into a market that doesn't exist. You're trying to sell online, but nobody's there to buy it. It was a bit like the people who, you know, imagine trying to be a bookseller just after the printing press has been invented and nobody can read. It was a hard, hard sale to make. But so the bubble was bound to burst, and we've always had bur uh, bubbles emerging and bursting as this whole wave of technology comes and goes. Just to f finish the Google story, Bryn and Page, I really must speed up because we're only at 94. So <laughs> Bryn and Page um, published their paper uh, on the World Wide, on, sorry, on Google, the algorithm that, that found, you know, they used to find Google, about how to find things on the web using the links. So they didn't just use the search for the term you were looking for in the document. They also used the links to work out who, how many people were looking at that document. So it was effectively a recommender system that we all, every time we make a link, we help Google make money. Just think about that, people. Not only do we just destroy a tree, we help Google make money. Because Google doesn't work unless we make links. So if we all stop making links, they don't. Anyway, I don't want Google not to work. I just want them to be careful about what they do. But, um, uh, where was I going with that one? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so they, they, that, but it's nearly 10 years after the web started that we got a search engine. Before that, we had Yahoo and we had, what were the others, Infovista and others. But in the early days, they used to print directories of what websites had been published that night or, you know, here's our favorite, we always keep lists of our favorite websites. And we thought that was enough. And no, it wasn't. You had to have uh, something like Google to make it work. But you couldn't build Google until the web, there was enough web there to make it a return on investment. All right? And then, of course, they had to, when they published the paper, they'd done the science, they had to prove it scales. Imagine the idea. If you'd really thought about it in 1998, 
the idea of harvesting the web we have today, day in, day out, all the time, everywhere, in order to make Google work, just mind-boggling. But they've done the engineering to show it work, and then they had to get the business model. And boy, has that become successful. And now they're, of course, going into phones and everything. Uh, phones and driverless cars and amazing company. But to speed up then, we're now... The, web, the browser's changed so we could write to the web, which is always part of Tim's vision. Uh, and once we get that, we started to get the web blogs or the blogs, and the um, social network started to emerge. And boy, did we underestimate how much people would want to tell the world about themselves and communicate. We just underestimate what we've known about people forever is we like communicating. And we're into the world of social networking, mobile web, and what next? Well, the one thing to remember is the web is actually a networking network. It's an amazing complex system that grows because we put stuff on it. I'll come back to that later. We, we create, we build the web in that sense. Um, so here's, uh, I, must, I should take the second mic off, but it doesn't really fit here because the technology hasn't yet developed to be fast enough for things like Second Life to become mass. But they will in the future. But things like, um, you know, we've, I've mentioned most of those as the things that dominate our lives today, and we're using them all in education in various different ways. And I was in Malaysia last week, and I gave a talk, and I wanted to put a new Wikipedia slide up to illustrate how we build the web. And uh, so I'm in Malaysia, and when I Google to get Wiki Wikipedia, I don't know why I did that, but anyway, uh, it comes up in Malaysia, and I thought... Who's the person the Malay people will know more than anybody? And I thought about the Queen and I thought, no, David Beckham. So <laughs> this was the slide I used last week. Just to make the point that when we were developing microcosm, I used to think, wouldn't this be wonderful? It, you can see the, the power of the links you could have. We did an experiment with the, um, I think it was the OED, the, the Oxford English Dictionary, and we got a digital version of it and we automatically generated all the links for all the terms in the dictionary so that you could take from a document, click on any word, and go to the reference in the dictionary. We thought we were very clever, didn't we, Hugh? Because uh, it was cool. But, of course, you had to buy the OED to do that. What Jimmy Wiles has a view of is this is how it works in the web, is you, you get the people to create it. And when it started, people said, yeah, this won't work. Even Jimmy Wiles is quoted to say he didn't think it would work. And now look how we use it. And actually, of course, it works because it's faster than the printed version in terms of being corrected. It's, it's developing its own rules um, and management governance system as to who's allowed to, to change things. Most people, you can edit things. If, you know, there's, there, there are, and, and there are certain people can take pages down if they become misused. But um, generally, it grows because people write for it. And the factual stuff, you know, the science and the history and the uh, um, geography and all that, um, you know, there's so much there. And you now go to it and it's there. That whatever you want to find, it's there. And um, the amazing thing about it is that's happened in the last, what, eight years? Will it be there forever? I mean, eight years is nothing in terms of the development of information systems and dictionaries and encyclopedias. It's nothing. And imagine if it wasn't there tomorrow. Just imagine if you woke up, none of this was there. And we, what's happening is with the speed of time we're doing this, this is happening. The industries that create, the old industries are disappearing. So you can't go and buy a printed encyclopedia anymore. They don't produce them. So if the web died and Wikipedia died with it, we'd have to find a way very quickly to recreate the encyclopedia industry. But of course, anyway, that's all you know, things to hypothesize about. So Wikipedia, YouTube, I mean, what a difference YouTube makes in terms of, and that's, this is very recent, really. Of course, it's scary that it's all owned by Google, but, you know, this is how we are getting our entertainment. We're also making our entertainment. And, you know, I put up the Doctor Who page, and you can see not only the latest episodes on the BBC, but all the history stuff, you know, and all the old episodes and bits of them, and oh, so much. It's a, a, an unbelievable tool for entertainment and, of course, for education. I mean, this is, I assume, the way the MOOCs will go out eventually. You know, you have to, oh, the people trying to make money out of this stuff have to think about this. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean 
universities here. I mean, the companies who are seeking to make money out of technology for MOOCs. Look at what's happened with YouTube and just think, are you actually going to make money out of your company? Uh, so, and a bit about the giant attractor. Remember all this. Twitter, it's another one. A lovely story is about Twitter. Um, the, uh, I'm running out of time. I can't tell you all these stories, but basically, it started as something that told me what I had for breakfast and is now uh, a tool for just, uh, saving lives and marketing and disseminating information. And I always remember that when, when um, Stephen Fry, this is the early days of Twitter, the first two years in the UK, Nigel's, Nigel, my colleague, Nigel Shabbat, is an early adopter. I didn't start until much later. But Stephen Fry, one of the gadget freaks, famously tweeted from a lift. He was stuck in a lift in July 2008. And he just picked up his iPhone 3G. So that's what, and that's, we're into this mobile world. And, you know, one of my PhD students um, did these graphs. I'll just flip through them. It's not, uh, um, so the red is the number, of, you know, that, that's human in total, the number of iPhones. The blue is the Android. And the black line is the number of registered Twitter users. And the black dotted line are the, um, sorry, the registered. And the black solid line is the active. And um, if you look at October 2010, where you had a huge spurge in registered users, not all active, what happened? Things like um, the World Cup, the Arab Spring in 2011, um, and the Haiti earthquake in January 2010. This all got, these were all disseminated on Twitter. And um, this is what got people very interested in this mechanism. You get things faster on Twitter. And then if you move forward, you get the Arab Spring and the, the Japanese earthquake. I said, London 2012, 80,000 tweets per second uh, over the world. I haven't got time, but you all know about citizen science. This is another thing that's changing the face of everything, that people who don't know anything about science can help identify galaxies. This is really going big. There's lots of work, and I think it's going to have a major impact on science education if we use it well. I'm speeding up a bit. The other thing I love is Louis van Arm, who's the Duolingo. Have you come across Duolingo or Capture? Have a look. This is a wonderful way. This, the, the Capture thing, if you, when you type in words to prove you're not a... Well, sorry, when you recognize um, handwriting to prove you're not a robot, if you get a second one, you're helping to, to uh, translate documents from handwriting. You know, if, if the... Um, I can't think of the word when you scan from handwriting into, into uh, sorry? Thank you. Um, then uh, you, you're doing that. And what he's doing with the languages is he's helping you learn the language, and at the same time, you're translating the words. And his vision is that, thanks, Malcolm, his vision is that we will, um, I've got 10 minutes, it's good. His, his vision is that we, billions of people, can translate, end up translating every document on the web to every other language by this mechanism. He can show you the maths when he gives the keynote. He's great. So, um, I've got a feeling, link data, very quickly. The web now is a web of data. This was always part of Tim's vision, was this uh, very rich web. It's more than just linking documents and people. Um, and here we are, two nights and a day. How about that, folks? I can't believe it. Um, I don't know how many papers I've written by uh, two nights in a day, but um, this is the paper we wrote in 2006 about actually the semantic web, forget all this artificial intelligence worrying about proving whether an ontology is correct or not. It's all about data, putting data out in a standard form and linking it up. That was the semantic web we visited. And actually, it was always part of Tim's vision because machines can process data and interpret it in ways that we can't. Machines are pretty poor at documents. They can find documents, but they can't work out what's in them. But a machine can do wonderful things with data and make inferences. This is what we were trying to do with Microsoft years ago. Of course, the other big thing that's happened is, in, is that in thinking about why we need, what, why, what the benefits of data were, and why we couldn't get people to think about a web of data, because it is more harder than a web of documents. Tim and Nigel, well, Tim on the Atlantic and that Tim and Nigel on this side of the Atlantic. Tim in, in America and Tim and Nigel on this side started talking to governments about putting data out uh, as open data. And 
now that's that's really picking up and, and industry is doing it as well for all sorts of reasons transparency efficiency uh, economic and social value the UK is funded via the data Institute and linked open data is even more powerful than we are and of course we're into big data I want to get to the point there's there's the whole story of open data that um, you need to, and they've start, they funded the UK government funded the open data Institute and all sorts of things like uh, Putting data up, for example, tells you not who, what the GPs, not who they're prescribing the drugs for, but what type of drugs they're producing. So you can work out which GP surgeons are spending too much on proprietary drugs, for example. And you can look at that as a patient of that surgery and work it out. There's so many things you can do in this world. We at Southampton are, have an open data service. We're putting all our um, data about the university out as open data, and recently we've put all our putting all our information about courses, who teaches the courses, um, timetables, all is open data for the students, for the people to write apps and for the students to use, um, and about our facilities. And I think there's a movement in the UK really to get this going as a means for institutions to link up their data um, using this open data. There's a thing called Chris Gutteridge at Southampton runs data.ac.uk. There are several universities, I know Oxford's on as well as us, several universities who put are into this. And this will, this will create new ways of students being able to ask, where's the best place to study computer science? Or where can I learn about um, medieval history? Where can I do a degree about medieval history? Without having to trawl through Google, there, there'll be answers to questions. Anyway, this is an exciting world. And this is really at the heart of this... Um, our development of web science, and I, I haven't got time to tell you the whole story, but basically, as I've said, we've created this thing called the web. We put the content on, and we've created this very complex macro phenomenon that grows of its own accord. And our theory was, our being Tim and I, and myself, and, and Danny Weitzer, and Jim Henry in the States, that we needed to study this, and we called it web science, and um, it's a very socio-technical idea. The point is, it isn't just about the technology, it's about people too, it's people's people. And that's what I think is so important for educators um, to, to get this, not, not everyone has to study web science, but to get this idea that it isn't just about technology, it's about human behaviour, and it's about economics, and it's about politics, and it's about law, and it's about maths. And there's so many things. Five minutes, right. So we launched web science, and we run conferences, and we have a network of labs around the world, and... The bit about the web being a socio-technical system uh, is that Tim didn't create the web, he invented it, as I said. And as my social science friends say, we technologists think about things in a deterministic way. I'm going to build a machine that takes in this stuff and puts out that stuff. That's not how this technology works, because we've no idea when we build stuff. Who's going to use it? How they're going to use it? And um, so it's actually about co-constitution. So what we're doing is about people, human beings and the technology working together to create something, artifacts that wouldn't have existed before. I'm flicking through now because I'm running out of time. Web social technical. And we talk about building social machines. And I think, again, this is hugely important for education. Tim coined the phrase in his book, Weaving the Web. He said, computers help if we can use them to create abstract social machines on the web processes in which people do the creativity and the machines do the administration. And we're seeing our students learn by building the most amazing social machines. Little embryonic ones, but any at the web, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, Louis Van Aanstuff, TripAdvisor, Galaxy Zoo, Amazon, eBay, they're all social machines. The technology goes out there, but they only work because we, in our millions and billions, use them. And then they, 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 they adapt and they change because we want to do other things with them. And so the technology then adapts and changes, and it is a co-constitution. It's really, really important if you're doing anything on the web. Um, I'm going to skip through this because we haven't got time. A social machine is not a Turing machine. If it can be done on the Turing machine, I would argue it's not a social machine. That's another talk. Um, I've got two things I want to say before I finish. One is, hugely important in this whole world is being able to study what's happening. So we started to talk about this idea called a web observatory. Rather like the physicists 
have their telescopes trained on the stars, and they gather all that data, and then they analyze it and share it and analyze it to map the universe. And the climate scientists do that. Climate scientists, environmental scientists do that for the physical planet and all the other people I haven't mentioned. We need to do it for the digital planet. We, our network of labs, we're beginning to take the research work that our students are doing, the data they're collecting, the tools they're using to analyze it and share it. And uh, we have pilots at Southampton. And I think I'm going to whiz through this because I'm going to run out of time. And I can just give you the, the words here. I could do loads of demos from one of my students. But basically, the idea is that anybody can be an observatory. If they, it's a bit like the open access stuff where we came up with standards for sharing scholarly papers. This is standards for sharing evidential data. If you can, it's not all open. Some of it will be very confidential and secret. You may just be able to share the derived data or the metadata. But also sharing the tools, and we're getting companies involved as well to really make this grow as a, as a global effort. Um, and then we can do longitudinal research studies and develop business intelligence cases. Uh, but the longitudinal research is what really excites me in this, this area. Because what I'd love to be able to do is look back 10 years and see what was happening when Google started to emerge. What were people using and then how did they move on to Google? You know, what happened? And so looking back to me is as important as looking forward. So this is the most exciting project I think I've ever been involved with in my career. The ambition is to map the digital universe. Um, I will just say, now these are the, I'm just coming up with my last slide coming up. There's a whole team of us at Southampton. We've got this lovely DTC centre. We have up to, we have 50 PhD students working in this area now. Uh, that was the first intake, nice and diverse, not all computer scientists. They come from social science and psychology and economics and so on. And we just launched an undergraduate program this year, which I'm very excited about. It'll take a while to grow, but I'm really excited about training people for their first degree in this world. And this is my last slide, I think. Yes. So where are we now? It is 2013, isn't it? I do look around the planet a bit. It is 2013. I've got one minute. This is my last slide. So, um, the web, in some ways, has changed everything about what we do. You know, we and our students work with computers all the time, or mobile phones, or iPads, or uh, you know, whatever the technology emerges. And the conference here will demonstrate will it have, has, or will have. You're in the middle of it demonstrated this to us. It's, it's just, it's part of our DNA now. That's what's happened in the last 20 years. But actually, as Seymour Papert used to say, he maybe still does, I mean, the guy's not dead, but he was one of my <laughs> inspirations for coming into computing. Mindstorms was the book. Actually, I just had a brainstorm. No, 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 I'll tell you about that over dinner, those who uh, don't live one. But anyway, sorry. Um, Mindstorms was like the, one of the books that got me into, into doing computers. But he used to say that if, uh, you know, 100 years ago, an alien from another planet landed here, saw what, how things worked, and then, so that would be 1913, and then comes forward to 2013, lands back here, what's changed? The way, thing, the way we do almost everything, medicine, um, traveling, um, uh, manufacturing, um, uh, shopping, banking, anything like that, booking holidays, has changed dramatically. What hasn't really changed, in essence, is education. It's still, I hesitate to say in this company, because people who know more about this than I do, it's still the sort of Socratic style of people come and listen at the feet of the master or mistress. Um, it's people still go and sit the flat you are here. Um, classrooms, lectures, theatres, in schools, colleges, and universities. Now, that, there are things breaking around the edges, but that is still the fundamental way we do education. Of course, there are examples of distance learning. Every country's got its open university, and there's lots of people in remote places where you have to do that bit. But the, base, the vast majority of us still go to a school and go to a university, and part of that, of course, is what else happens there apart from just the transfer of information from one brain to another? But my EER, when I was a, a, a math student, we used to get set 
easy exercises for the reader. So my easy exercise for you guys is, having taken on board everything I've said about the web and how it works and the difference it's made in many things that we do, what difference are moots going to make? I'll leave you with that. Thank you.